Desideratum is a Latin word, meaning things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates the art of telling and the journey of listening to stories with narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith, Friends. Episode 9, Garden Crow. You know, I, when, when I write, I see it visually. You know, I, I actually um, I can see the movement. I can hear the music. Um, so I, I, I guess I have sort of a cinematic approach to writing because I'm extremely visual. So I, I absolutely can see it, can, can feel it, can hear it. That's Robert Gwaltney. You'll get a chance to hear his visual writing in today's featured story. The Garden Crow. It's a special excerpt from his debut novel, The Cicada Tree. But first, we'll talk about how powerful our early years and early experiences are, and what his grandmother's advice was about where to sit. And this is my favorite part. What role does music play in his writing? Music has become such a critical part of my writing habit, and usually it's classical. You know, the the central musical theme for the Cicada Tree was uh, Moonlight Sonata, and you know, and Moonlight Sonata is in three movements and three pieces. And so I sort of looked at the story in three acts, utilizing the tone of Moonlight Sonata, and so I listened to Moonlight Sonata constantly throughout. And then I would also listen to some music from the period. Um, you know, I would listen to Doris Day. Um, from the 50s, yes. From the 50s, yeah. I'd listen to some, some of the 1950s music, some old religious um, Southern hymns as well, just, you know, to try to get you into that, into that headspace. I think that's true of so many different creative outlets that the addition of music, the mood of music can is a powerful uh, I agree. Yeah, a, a powerful amplifier. I like that. I think that's the greatest compliment that like I think any artist can be given is to is to impact others' feelings, you know, and their their point of view. And if you can evoke that emotion within a brush stroke or a lyric or a novel, you know, I think that you know you've done something special. Right. That's sort of the point, isn't it? Yeah all those artistic endeavors is to, to yeah. invoke that kind of emotion from the, yeah. listener, from the viewer. Exactly. And I think that it's when you can find those universal truths that, that a wide swath of people can relate to, you know, then I think that's, that's when you've hit a chord. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, pun <intended. laughs> no, pun, no pun intended. So do you have early memories of, of being read aloud to, or reading or writing from, from your early childhood? Well, my mother always read to me. Um, and I can remember being a young boy, preschool, kindergarten. I remember that, you know, after lunch, you know, dad would come home and would have lunch with us uh, every day and during the summers. And after lunch, mom would, you know, clean the kitchen. We would I would get in the rocking chair right next to her or in her lap and she would always read me a story before I had to go down for a nap. So I do recall, and there, we had one of those um, large volumes of the Grimm's fairy tales, which are, I mean, are pretty frightening. <laughs> but so she would, she would sanitize them a bit for me. But yeah, she was always, always reading to me. Those formative years, it really creates, you know, your frame of reference. You know, they say within the first five years of a, of a child's birth that those are the most critical uh, in a child's brain development. The, the, the brain grows the greatest amount within those first three to five years. So, you know, you've come out of those years about as good as you're going to get from a brain development perspective. I mean, I mean, of course, science tells us today that you can you can impact that, you know, as an adult, but it takes a lot of work. And so we are um, greatly influenced by those early years. So I, I believe that, um, that my writing is definitely impacted by those early memories of my childhood and my young adulthood. Yeah, I, I don't think that 
I would be the writer today if I hadn't had the experiences that that I've had and if I and that I didn't grow up where I had grown up. As you got older then, did you keep journals? Did you write stories as you were get growing up? In my early 20s, I began to keep journals and then I would dabble in short stories. And I would say within the last 15 years is when I got extremely serious about the process of writing because I had this sense that time is passing. If I don't do it now, it will never happen. And I just immersed myself when I moved to Atlanta into the the literary community. You know, I, I began to take classes. I joined a critique group. Um, and so these last 15 years have been a, a great learning opportunity. And it was through, through making that decision that it was now or never that, you know, I've been able to find myself where I am today. Coming together in a writing community sounds like it, it really helped you grow in ways that you couldn't have done lonely by yourself. Oh, absolutely. Well, I've always felt like in life, you always surround yourself with people that are smarter or more gifted or talented than you. I remember my granny, my granny Louise, well, I think it was like my, my first day of first grade, um, leaned down and whispered in my ear. She said, um, always sit next to the smart people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's take, you know, it took me a little while to figure out exactly what she, she meant by that, but she was always very particular about who you aligned yourself with in life because, you know, and she is true, you know, the, 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 the quality of people that you surround yourself with is really going to drive the quality of your own life, I believe, you know, it can help move you forward. So it was important to have a community of writers, and I've been working with the same critique group for about a decade now, you know, a, a small group of us. And it's helpful um, because when you write in isolation, uh, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees, truly. You know, you do need to have other people's eyes on your work um, just to make certain that you're on track and that you're moving in the right direction. So the point of view character is 11. In this she's a, yeah, she's 11. So it, you know, it said so the story takes place in 1956. So it is an older Annalise Newell who is looking back on the summer of her 11th year in 1956. So I did that intentionally so that I wouldn't necessarily be boxed in with the vocabulary of an 11 year old, you know, so I could get the, the 11 year old dialogue um, as true as I could make it. But then I was able to through, you know, in those elements of exposition, able to be able to utilize the language that I love to use. So, you know, you've got someone looking back and remembering the summer of our 11th year. Garden Crow. Meanness and secrets sprouted plentiful at 2116 Mayfield Trail. Together, they conspired creeping like runner vines, finagling behind the clapboard, curling the paint to ribbons. Daddy's whiskey and my deep down good kind of hurt, all of it knocked at the mortar and twisted in the soffits, sending silent vibrations through the ramshackle. The soil was rich for trouble then, plowed and harrowed, fertile for blame and regret. Fallow of apologies. Not a smidge of acre fit for sweet onions, watermelon, or even a turnip seed to grow. And flowers from Daddy? Never had there been those. Not even daisy petals pulled from a stem. At least, until then, the afternoon they mysteriously appeared, as if summoned by enchantment to rest upon the rickety back porch steps. A commotion of fine-smelling blooms, peacocking in a Brunswick star, cut glass vase. I was the one to find them. But it was Miss Wessie, the woman who looked after her granddaughter, Etta May, and me, who took them out of the heat and into the kitchen. You two get on out of here and away from these here flowers, she said, her joints shooting off like pop guns when she walked across the room. Away from here, Miss Wessie said. Lucinda ain't done drying yet. 
Etta May and I watched her granny scoot the vase across the table to rest next to Lucinda, Miss Wessie's favorite church-going wig. I held my breath until she finished her chore, straightening and centering her hair on two stacked jars of freshly canned peaches. We want to stay here with the flowers, I said. Keep watch over them for Mama. We won't worry, Miss Lucinda Nunn. We promise. Miss Lady, they'll be here for her to see when she gets home from down at that pickle factory. She shook her head, her everyday kerchief slipping back a bit. If these flowers got a mind to wander off or die before then, well, that'll be that. Who are they for? Edame said, raising herself up onto her tippy toes, those tiny, pecan-colored hands clasped beneath her chin. Who they for? Had Edame's court come loose? Of course they were for Mama, a long-time coming gift from Daddy. Sometimes, as it happened, acrimony took a hold of me, uncontrollable and shocking as a hiccup. That's a dodo bird kind of question to ask, I said, wrapping my arms around myself, searching for a body to choke, digging my nails right to the edge of that nice-feeling place. Daddy sent them for Mama. Etta May deflated, lowering back to the floor with the sorrowful speed of a give-out party balloon. Immediately, I felt remorse. Etta May was a friend, like a sister to me. She was filled all the way to the top and brimming with goodness, not half spilled out like me. But mostly, I was scared. Scared of Miss Wessie and the look kneading in those tricky butterscotch eyes. She scratched her kerchief and bent over, pressing her palms into her black, glossy knees, lingering for a moment before standing back up straight again. Miss Lady... I reckon what Etta May says ain't such a silly thing. She spoke slowly and measured. How you know who sent them with any certainty is beyond me. Again, she clawed at her head, the threat of her pulling off the kerchief growing greater, the very act a declaration of war. Etta May and I stepped backwards. Granny? Etta May said, panic and consolation swirling in her voice. Annalise, she didn't mean anything by it, did you? I gave my head a shake. There ain't no card, not so much as a scrap of note, Miss Wessie said, stepping forward. Not even a sorry old heart-shaped something drawn out yonder in the quick-drying mud to say who sent them. And you think... You know it was your sorry daddy that done it. I took another step backwards, bumping into Etta May. Miss Wessie, I... Mr. Claxton, Miss Wessie said. Some years done pass by since I knew him to show your mama a sweetness. And now suddenly, you think a change come over him? She tugged at the back of her head wrap, a thatch of white hair sneaking out. So you tell me, who is the dodo bird in this here room? Dodo bird? A case of those devilish hiccups threatened the room, a drunk daddy mess of meanness on the rise. You, you, you hush your mouth. Etta May wheezed, grabbing hold of my waist, a reflex intended most likely to keep her from toppling to the floor. In a breath, Miss Wessie reached up and snatched off her kerchief. Her hair, a thick crop of silvery white, shone like sparklers, a dazzling, living thing in the room. She sucked in all the air from the place. Gonna count to three, she said. I regarded her temples, the throbbing spot where the hair wound tight and angry darkening to the color of thunderstorms. And then you'll know what. 
Before Miss Wessie could even set out to count, Etta May and I took off out of the house. Across the porch we ran, fresh fallen curls of paint crunching beneath our naked feet. I took in the sound, the delight of sharp edges sticking and slicing at the tender spots, that flirty tingle of pain. Halfway to the garden, the angry tears came. I regarded my running feet, desperate for the sharp edge of a rock or the glory of a cocklebur, anything to comfort, a merciful something to thrill and sop up tears. Etta May and I collapsed at the base of the old oak in a ramble of sword fern and cast iron leaves, the two of us leaning on our knees, collecting our breath. Mean, 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 I said, wrapping my hand into a frond, snatching the stem loose from the root. Why does your granny have to be so mean? I wrapped the long leaf about my pale wrist, tightening it best I could, imagining it cutting all the way down to the bone where the good hurt lives. I pulled harder, courting the feeling, enticing the shameful thing I needed. She knows them flowers are from Daddy. My breath caught in my throat, the clench that comes before a spill of sorrow. I yanked harder, urging it along. That sneaking, snaking thing, caressing and feeling its way to my hideaway places. Etta May took hold of my hand, unwound the frond, and tossed it to the side. You made her mad, is all. She tangled her little fingers through mine. Of course your daddy sent them, she said, leaning into me, her voice lullaby sweet. You're right, she said softly. Sometimes I am a big old dodo bird. I squeezed my Etta May's itty-bitty hand and whispered, I'm sorry. Mercifully, like all the times before, she squeezed back. We stayed that way for a spell, quiet in our exile, leaking like faulty spigots, our underthings soaked through with perspiration. Etta May broke the silence. Got something to tell you, she said. Okay, what is it? She was quick, turning loose my hand, hurrying over behind the old wooden bench, pulling at something beneath the azaleas. She shot back over to me, looking over her shoulder, something pressed to her chest. Kneeling in front of me, she whispered, Found it two days ago in an old rusty watering can underneath the house. She pressed a half-full bottle of Old Crow whiskey into my lap. What you doing with this? I said, whispering back, lifting it up to get a closer look. I hid it out here so Mr. Claxton couldn't get after it. She pulled at my hands, lowering the bottle back to my lap. On occasion, I had seen a whiskey bottle or two, but never close up. Daddy was good at hiding things, a skill for which I had great admiration. A slant of sun cut through the oak's branches, catching light in the bottle, sparking in the hooch. It's pretty, I said, like your granny's eyes. Butterscotch, the color of trouble. I gave the bottle a shake and screwed off the top. Etta May squeezed my knee. What you fixin' to do? Never you mind, I said, lifting the bottle to my nose. Annalise! I'm just smelling it, I said. The scent was not near about as unpleasant as expected. A different kind of smell coming straight out of the bottle than from Daddy's breath. From the recipe of whiskey and aftershave leaking from his skin. You want a sniff? Etta May leaned away from me, swatting at the bottle. You're going to get us killed, she said, looking over her shoulder to the house. If Granny catches us with that, we won't be sitting down till the sweet Lord calls us back to glory. I'm not scared of her, I said, passing the bottle beneath my nose. That's mighty big talk, Etta May said knocking and grabbing for the bottle. 
The cicada chorus rose up, worrying at me, prodding me along. I wonder what all the hullabaloo's about, I said, holding that old crow just out of Etta May's reach. Perhaps it was the color of butterscotch that made me do it, hypnotizing me like a carnival gypsy. Or the hysterical screech of that cicada song. Or maybe it was both, tricking and taunting me to tip back that bottle and take a greedy gulp. Annalise Newell! Etta May yelled. Hush up, I said, shutting my eyes, taking in the slow burn trailing down my throat, the scorch spreading across my insides. Like the smell, the taste was not as troublesome as I imagined. Better than castor oil or a swallowed-down scoop of mentholatum. Etta May squeezed my wrist, agitating the place the fern stem choked. Are you crazy? Might be, I said, opening my eyes. Hard to know. You drunk yet? She whispered, leaning into me, scrutinizing me from one end to the other. Don't be silly. It takes more than a little old sip to get drunk. Truth be told, I did feel woozy, like the end of a good spin on a tire swing. Feel any different? I took another swig. A little, I whispered. You want some? The devil's done grabbed hold of you, Annalise Newell. She slapped at my hand. Don't send him chasing after me. I screwed the top back on the bottle and motioned for Etta May to sit down on the ground next to me. I lay my head in her lap, the whiskey bottle rising and falling on my belly. Up into the big oak's branches, I blinked, the sun weaving through, crocheting lace doilies all around. Fiddle with my hair, sweet-like, and sing me something nice, I said in a sleepy time voice. Okay, but not another sip. Promise? Promise. Etta May curled long strands of my hair around her fingers turning it loose to tickle my cheeks. The old crow fanned its fire-lit wings, heating my insides, smoking and clouding my mind. A sweet, slow sort of burn. Could this be how it felt to be daddy, floating and bobbing? And when was it that the meanness would come? Might it be quick, like a hiccup? I imagined Daddy laying there beside me, both of us with fire in our chests. Without a word, we share secrets, the whiskey bottle tipping to Daddy's lips and to mine. There, on the dandelion bed, the smut grass poking up all around, understanding takes root. That a bad thing can be good. That salvation is the tricky color of butterscotch. That rapture is pain. Etta May started up singing, her angel voice and the whiskey casting a spell upon me, nudging big shimmery tears to swell and spill from the corners of my eyes. Above us, the sun turned lazy, slouching in the sky. Three shadows fade into the weeds deep down beneath the earthworms to dark, cool places far from the caw and burn and scratch of that old garden crow. Your main character is um, extraordinary, and this, this compulsion that she has in the story about trying to hurt herself or these allusions to pain are captivating. But what is that about? Where does that come from? Sort of that fine line between agony and, and ecstasy and self-discovery and coming of age. So it's, it's, um, it's something that escalates over the course of the story, this sense of um, this good kind of hurt. It's very compelling. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the short story so much and I don't wanna to give too much more away about the book itself. Um, I always like to ask about essential things because the podcast theme is really what is essential. So 
what are some of the things that you think are essential for you? Well, I think that, I think for me to be happy, you know, I think I need, you know, just a handful of, of, of people that I can connect with, um, you know, on an emotional level, you know, friendships that are, are deeply rooted. Um, you know, I think that um, having emotional connections with people in life is essential. You know, I think that, you know, there's, um, I want, I want to know, you know, as much as a person will let me know about themselves, you know, I, I like to feel close to people. And um, so I think that having caring relationships, I think that that's certainly essential. And purpose, I think purpose is essential. For me, I don't know that I could be happy if I didn't have the opportunity to ride. And it's just, you know, a form of, I think you're able to work through a lot of things when you're riding, fiction, nonfiction. And it's just, you know, you have those days where you sit back and you think, oh gosh, today, today was a great day. You know, and there's just this sense of, of accomplishment when you feel that you've been able to find the truth on the page as close as a person can find it. You know, what, what's that real true moment? Have you been able to capture it? And I think that that's, that's essential for anyone to believe anything anyone writes, you know, <laughs> is truth. You can find Robert's Truth on the Page on his website. I highly recommend checking out his blog and connecting with him on Facebook. He's open and kind and funny. His Southern literary fiction, The Cicada Tree, will be available January 2022. Thanks for listening.